Hello, everybody. Welcome to implementing microservices as Kubernetes operators. Um, get out of the way early. The, of course, slides are going to be available. We've got a demonstration, the source code of which will be available as well. We've got some QR codes at the end for, and links. Uh, so you're welcome to pick those up uh, at the end of the deck. Uh, before we get into it, I have a, a couple questions. Uh, it'd be interesting to see the number of people who raise their hand for this, given where we are in DevConf and how often I've heard that. Kubernetes and other talks. So who in here has used or heard of Kubernetes? All right, a lot, as expected. Uh, know about controllers and operators? All right, a little fewer hands. How about microservices? in the right place. <laughs> microservices? More, okay. Mm -hmm. And then who's written a controller or an operator? All right, good. You're, yeah, you're Who's here. ready for work tomorrow? <laughs> no, I'm not ready for work. Um, so today, uh, for those who maybe didn't raise your hand for what, understanding Kubernetes, we're going to go through a high level of what Kubernetes is, uh, an understanding of, of operators, and um, why we believe operators are microservices. And then finally, we're going to end up with a, a demo of creating a creating an operator building it, deploying it, and testing it here in the room live. Could we do that? Yeah, well, the demo gods hopefully will allow us to do that. Cross your fingers. <laughs> so I'm Naveen Malik. I'm a senior principal site reliability engineer on the OpenShift SRE platform team. Uh, background in software engineering, software architecture, father of two little boys. I run a whole lot and sometimes make things with a uh, overly expensive 3D printer for, I used to make toys for my kids. Uh, I'm Lisa Seeley. I'm a uh, senior SRE on the same team as him. Uh, it's a word to so I'm not going to say it. Uh, I come from a primarily system and background with systems administrator, with software engineering in there too. I'm becoming a Canadian, I hope. Hey, uh, I love my cat. I can't wait to get home to visit him. I like all cats. So if you have cat pictures, I want to see them. If you have cat pictures on an ARM architecture, I'm into ARM too, so show me your cat pictures on your ARM clusters. That's me. So I don't have any cats right now. But I do have a couple of dogs. I think it may be acceptable, Lisa. Like the, the guy on the left here, Sprocket, is a Japanese chin, which is the most cat-like dog we could find. So basically, he ignores us unless he wants something. Show right? hands. Is that okay? Cat-like dogs? <laughs> yeah. All right, we're good. You're it's as close as we could get. My kids are allergic. Um, so Kubernetes, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar, haven't heard about it yet, quick overview. It's a platform, an open source platform, for uh, managing your containerized workloads. It allows you to declare some configuration, and then the platform realizes that as the running state for you. Uh, it comes with a plethora of resources as a part of the platform, with uh, application uh, manage applications to, to software to manage those resources for you, and it allows you to extend the platform with customizations. You can do custom resources and then custom business logic around those resources, so you can tune like add things into the platform itself, uh, make it work for your, your business needs. Uh, just real quick, why we're here and why this talk is really exciting for both of us is that on the SRE team, uh, we manage all of Red Hat's OpenShift dedicated offering. Uh, we manage a large number of OpenShift clusters, uh, which are a flavor of Kubernetes and we, with, for our enterprise customers. Um, and we do operators for all the things, so I'll, I'll get into a little bit of the history of that mm -hmm. later on. Uh, so OpenShift is to Kubernetes as well as to Linux, uh, and our OpenShift dedicated offering is a hosted service that we manage 24 by 7, follow the sun support. Um, I got paged in the middle of the keynote on Friday <laughs> as an example for something blowing up. Um, quick plug, we are hiring. We have 12 recs open as of the 15th of January. Uh, so there's a booth, if you're interested, stop by to the Red Hat booth and ask, or you know, come talk to Lisa or myself. Mm -hmm. um, love to hear about your interest, or if you have somebody you know that might be interested. So Lisa is going to yeah. walk us through how Kubernetes does its thing. Hey, me. Right, so uh, before we get too deep into operators and all that, I wanna review quickly how Kubernetes is applying our changes and how we tell Kubernetes to make changes for us. 
Uh, so when we install Kubernetes or OpenShift out of the box, we get a whole bunch of resources for free. We use these to express your applications. So that's like storage, configuration, how it's scheduled, and all of that good stuff. Uh, one resource that we get that is uh, critical to this talk is called the custom resource definition. Um, what it does kind of gives it away in the name, but we're going to be talking about this a lot for the rest of the talk. So how we use these resources is we declare YAML, we write YAML, um, and feed them into the Kubernetes API with uh, the kub. So we just learned how to say this. It's uh, kubectl, 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 um, kub, kubectl, kubectl, kubectl. Is that like the preferred? Yeah, that's way of that's the, now, that's apparently. a new that's yeah. a new canonical, but all are acceptable. We're told. Um, so we dump our YAML into the API server with that, but then what happens? Well, as it happens, just declaring YAML doesn't do enough, um, especially because if you're like me, you have tabs in the wrong places, or spaces in the wrong places, or tabs and spaces in the wrong place, and uh, the API server cares about that because controllers are that are the piece of code, the piece of logic that is watching all of these resources that they necessarily care about, and we'll see what that looks like soon. And that's the logic takes, I want this from YAML and makes it happen inside the cluster, right? So the next step is let's have a look at how operators are doing the same kind of thing. So as I mentioned, we get the custom resource definition type out of the box with Kubernetes, but that's up to us to make new custom resource definitions with that. And we'll see what that looks like too, don't worry. And they follow the same pattern where we're creating these with YAML and we have controllers that we're gonna write and Naveen will show you how to do that a little bit later to turn them into YAML, turn them from YAML into something that makes sense for us inside the cluster. Now, let's have a closer look at how a controller makes changes. So, the life of a controller looks a lot like this. Uh, at the start, it's just hanging out, just waiting for changes, it's in a loop. <coughs> It's keeping an eye on things. Uh, this particular controller, I just picked out of the blue deployment. I like deployment controllers, pretty cool. Um, let's see what happens when something changes with a deployment object. So when a change is made, the controller is gonna be notified of it and then reconcile the cluster towards that new desired state. Our request here is to create a three pod Nginx deployment running version 1.7.9 and so the controller is gonna make, do all it can to make sure that happens. Uh, this is a pretty simplified example, uh, but the fuller picture of how deployment works is on Kubernetes.io website. Um, and the YAML here is intentionally short because it's as long as my arm to do all the things that you need to do. But when we apply it, sometimes there's an error in it, right? Um, so in addition to typoing with spaces, I also sometimes hit the wrong key, and it's up to the controller to handle that. Maybe the controller will spit out an error. So if you've had an error in a deployment, if you're creating Kubernetes stuff, it'll say, hey, crash loop backup, crash loop backup, crash loop backup. That's kind of the same thing here. It's up to us, the administrators, to go in and fix it and then make a new object that the controller's gonna pick up, and then we get our pods. It's pretty neat. And then what happens next? The controller just sits around waiting for changes. Okay, okay, so this is the deployment. This is, comes out of the box. We don't have to write this. <laughs> what does it look like for an operator though? Well, at the start, you, you have a controller that we write that just sit around watching resources that it cares about, waiting for changes. And then it the code that we write in the controller is going to realize those and make the cluster the way that we want. And I think Naveen can tell us why someone would want to use this operator thing in the first place. Thanks, Lisa. And I actually want to talk more about the microservices side of this and why you might consider using an operator for that domain. Um, so just a quick overview of microservices. It's an architecture that's been around for a long time, and I've 
I come from uh, Red Hat IT before I joined this team and we've written a lot of services in that domain. And <laughs> basically we can call anything we want a microservice, just how you want to spin it. But there's a few, th a few um, facets that are fairly consistent across any kind of definition. And for the purpose of this discussion, um, we can talk about the context. So microservices have a bounded context. It simply means that you have a small business domain or a very small use case that you're trying to work for. You have to communicate over a network because you have lots of these things. They're micro. They do a very specific task. They do it really well, but that's usually not valuable in the context of some kind of business problem that you're trying to solve, so you need to have a lot of these talking to each other. And then because you have a lot of these, and maybe you didn't write all of them, maybe you bought some or other teams are dealing with them or creating them for you, you need to have some uh, technology agnostic protocols that they can communicate over. Is that like HTTP? Exactly. So? so uh, Postmail? <laughs> HTTP. You <laughs> I think RESTful service is an example. Uh, and then you organize these things around some business capability, the thing that you, you know, need to solve in your, your business domain, and that thing becomes an independently deployable component. Uh, you may want to have uh, some subset of microservices running in a Kubernetes cluster. Some may need to run in your data center on bare metal, depending on the workloads. You need flexibility, and they need to be independent. And usually you have some other things that you're concerned with. Um, security, there's a couple of facets here. Uh, one, because you have this small context, the surface of attack or potential abuse for this is much smaller uh, because you're dealing with a much smaller domain. Additionally, the microservices or services that I've ever developed and, and what we do in our day-to-day -day, um, need something to keep uh, um, unwanted users from getting in and, and using that service. And other things, I'm not going to enumerate all, you know, availability, scalability, you want these things to be online, you want to be able to grow them if your service is successful. So how do operators meet these needs? Well, as, as Lisa mentioned with uh, custom resources and uh, custom resource definitions, you can define a very small context. Uh, you have a very narrow scope. Uh, you get the platform's network to communicate over, and you get the platform's API. Kubernetes provides you an API to interact with these resources. You can have controllers that are focused on a specific resource, be it a you know, stock resource or a custom resource. Is that like the deployment only cares about deployments? Exactly. The deployment controller, you better deploy, you know, care only about the deployment resource. You might have a different controller for dealing with serv uh, secrets, something else that might deal with pods, mm. et cetera. And you can bundle these things together into a unit <laughs> and deploy them as Wait, your operator. So like multiple custom controllers into one thing? Right. If, if your business domain uh, requires you to deal with multiple resources in the same bounded context, you can bundle those into the single operator and deploy those. Cool. And then Kubernetes brings a lot of things to the table, just a few things for this talk, the authentication and authorization. <laughs> Kubernetes.io, right? You're a Kubernetes fan? List uh, them all. <laughs> uh, Kubernetes.io, everybody. Uh, lots of information there. Authentication authorization, you get a lot of uh, features from the platform around uh, users and uh, service account abil ability to access uh, resources within the cluster as well as what you're authorized to do. Like, I can get access, am I allowed to do something with a specific resource? Uh, the platform can be deployed in a very highly uh, available manner, which allows your deployments to be highly available, and then it is built with the scheduler to, to enable you to scale up your workloads across that platform. So that means operators are microservices. Huh. Yeah. Cool. Uh, but they could do a lot more. So I want to talk a bit about configuration management and a little bit of a story of how we got to where we are and why we are very excited about the operator space. Um, so we started off, uh, so our team has been using OpenShift uh, since the early days, version one. Um, and most recently on version three, we had a uh, centralized configuration management system. Uh, we decided to go with the Ansible-based uh, 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 solution that was provided with OpenShift uh, in order to configure all the OpenShift dedicated clusters. And this works great when you have uh, you know, a single cluster, easily manage it. Add a couple more, it's growing, it's scaling, it's keeping up, it's not a problem. When we start to get into 
large numbers of clusters, uh, it becomes pretty complicated. We have a lot of things that we're configuring. It makes it, it becomes hard for onboarding new members to the team. Uh, becomes difficult to understand when my change that I've merged is actually going to run. Uh, this thing, we, we called it uh, config loop, could take 12 hours to execute. Where is it in that execution? When is that cl the cluster that needs this hotfix going to have that configuration land? Should I kill the existing config loop process, start a new one? You know, all these types of things, it complicates uh, the landscape a lot. And then failures. Failures can now cascade into other places, so failure in configuring cluster two could potentially ripple into causing cluster three or other clusters uh, not to uh, update. So it's a problem. One light goes out, they all go out. Well, hopefully not quite all. But, <laughs> um, so where we are today is we are using um, microservices-based approach with operators with, to uh, implement a distributed configuration management platform. So we still have something in the middle that needs to apply some desired state to a cluster, but it's expressing that desired state. It's not expressing or configuring the running state. So we need a controller or a series of controllers to do that. And as we scale this out, it works really well because we are, as I said, we're, we're dealing with that one slice, the yellow on the left-hand side here of just defining what we want the cluster to look like. And if something fails, we have isolation. If there may be a failure in a single cluster, we can deal that with that by putting some metrics uh, that bubble up into an alert that might page the uh, correct SRE team to respond. And uh, it's a lot easier to understand. Everything is, is much easier to onboard new team members. So, Microservices or operators are allowing us to move towards operations as code. Um, we treat all of our operators as any other software engineering project. Uh, it's, uh, they're actually, if you're interested, they're out on GitHub on the um, OpenShift uh, organization. Uh, uh, come talk to us later if you're interested in, in taking a look at any of them. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a lot easier to onboard new members. We understand what's happening a lot. Easier, it's easier to manage the platforms, et cetera. So I'm going to hand over to Lisa, who is going to walk through some examples of these offers. That's right. So on the first key keynote on Friday, we saw a couple of operators that we're using. Uh, we're going to take a look at some other ones. But I'm going to take a look at it from kind of an operations point of view, uh, task-oriented. We need to do these things. And the things that we're going to look at are installing and configuring software, provisioning cloud credentials, and provisioning TLS certificates inside of a cluster for like inter, or, yeah, inter cluster communications. The first thing we're going to look at is installing and configuring software, and we're going to use cluster monitoring operator to do that. Now, the old days when we're installing software, we don't have operators, so we have to install it by hand. We need to configure it by hand. We need to install all of the pieces that we want to make up our monitoring stack. But since we're in Kubernetes and these deployment type objects don't have a concept of watching for config maps where we're storing our configuration. We have to write the glue to tell the deployment or tell Kubernetes to restart the pods with this new configuration every time we change something. So every new rule that we write for Prometheus, we need to restart that by hand somehow or write the glue for it. So let's look and see what the operator is giving us. So we can say that the cluster monitoring operator, first and foremost, is installing these things for us. That's, that's the easy part, right? Uh, the secret sauce really comes with Prometheus operator that comes along for the ride with the CMO, cluster monitoring operator. Prometheus operator, in turn, is giving us a couple of custom resources, specifically Prometheus rule, on how to configure Alert Manager and Prometheus itself. This is great because now we can interact with these Kubernetes objects and let the operator worry about how we turn that, not we, how it turns it into configuration files for the services and then restart those services as it needs to. 
Let's see what that looks like. So we're going to walk through a Prometheus rule a little bit at a time because it's a little overwhelming. Um, the operator has controllers that is watching for Prometheus rule type objects, kind Prometheus rule. This looks like almost every other Kubernetes object out there. We have the kind, we have the metadata, we have a name, namespace, all that good stuff. Labels even. Uh, let's look at the spec. The spec we have, this is different. This is specific to Prometheus rule. We have groups, which ties into Prometheus rules as it gets rendered out into the Prometheus config file. We have rules, a number of rules inside that group. And we have our alert, node, kub node, unschedulable SRE. Guess what it alerts on? The kub node is unschedulable. Huzzah, easy. So when we create this object in the cluster, the operator, the controller of that operator, will render this into config and that's it, okay? When we're done with it, we delete this object in Kubernetes and the operator removes it from the config file, restarts Prometheus, we're good to go. That's great. That's so much easier for us. Next thing we have to do all the time is provision cloud credentials. We do this with cloud credential operator. What's the workflow we're most familiar with when we need credentials in a, in a service? Well, you need to figure out who in the organization should get that request and then ask them for it. They go off and make sure you're even allowed to have those permissions. Then they give them to you encrypted, I hope. Uh, now you have these encrypted credentials and you have to figure out how to store them securely. Uh, you just put them in Git, right? No, no, you don't want to do that. So you have to figure out secrets management too. No, that's easy too, right? Uh, then you have to get the credentials securely into your cluster and keep that secure, but that's doable too, so that's cool. Uh, and then finally, you have to figure out how to scale that across every cluster, all of your users, and all the cloud providers. Good luck. How do we do this with an operator? Well, the operator introduces a new resource called credentials request. Similar to the Prometheus rule, this abstracts the notion of requesting cloud credentials in a pretty focused way. That means that the workflow is now, user creates a credentials request object, the operator's watching for it. With the request, the operator talks to the cloud provider, Amazon in this case, and stores their credentials in a secret. Cool, I don't have to talk to anyone. Just need to make sure I have permission to create this credentials request object. Okay, that needs to say outside, uh, say out loud, but what does it actually look like, all right? Yeah, and that user can access the secret. What does it actually look like? Well, let's look at a credentials request. Just like before, we have standard Kubernetes type stuff. We have our spec, where we want to store it. In this case, we're storing it in the aptly named secret to store credentials secret. The operator is going to see what permissions we want. In this case, we want to EC2 describe all of our instances. Pretty reasonable thing to be doing. And the uh, output, the operator is going to create a secret for us and it's going to access these. Um, good luck decrypting these. It's totally secure, I promise. And that's it. We have freed up human beings to do creative work. Since this is in all of our clusters, we have use the access permissions that Naveen mentioned earlier to control who can actually request this, which is great. Humans can focus on creative stuff. Next, we're gonna start talking about managing certificates. So you can talk to a Kubernetes service with encryption. We do this with service CA operator. This is different than certbin, which we learned about on Friday, by the way. How do we do it without an operator? Okay, this is actually somewhat easy to do. You connect to the cluster, and create a CSR, that's a certificate signing request. Then you still connect to that cluster and approve it with kubectl or kubectl, whatever you got, approve certificate signing request. Next, the, uh, the credentials are then associated with that CSR and you have to keep them safe. Not too bad, not too bad. Uh, you have to figure out how to scale it over all of your clusters. And, uh, who has access to all of the clusters in your environment at any given time to do this for someone? How do you get their credentials? How do you keep those safe? So that's still another problem. All right, operator, help us. 
This is actually a different approach to it. There's no s custom resources with this. All it's doing is looking at annotations on native objects. Service, that's a native object. All this operator is doing is looking for this long annotation, which I'm not gonna read aloud, it's kind of a tongue twister. What it's doing is, it's gonna, this controller that is from this operator will see this annotation, spit out the, the private certificate, and the, the key and the certificate, stuff it into a secret, and then it's also going to dump into a config map, which has this kind of annotation, the CA bundle. And now your deployment can use that mounted and your G-Unicorn process can serve TLS, secure, signed by the cluster, and you can connect to it, which is important if you're doing webhooks. Ask me how I know, talk to me after this talk. So that means that operators inc increase our velocity, our scalability, and the availability of all of these tasks that we need to do, because Kubernetes knows how to scale these and keep them running. But what's next? I mean, can you show us how to make one of these? Sure, I'd love to. So I'm um, going to walk through a bit of a contrived example, as I've <laughs> been very uh, clear in, in noting up here. Uh, we're going to create an operator called pod operator, but um, why? What's the purpose of showing everybody here how to create an operator? I want to make sure that we have um, you know, an understanding that it's really easy to get started with creating a Golang operator. Uh, get a sense of how to create a custom resource definition and a custom controller. And given the <laughs> time we have, um, you know, we can pack it in quite easily. It's, it's, it's fairly simple, as you'll see. Uh, before I write anything, though, I want to know what is it supposed to do? even for a demo. So there's three key things that I want this operator to do for us. Uh, first is when I create a custom resource, I want it to create a pod. I uh, want to ensure that pod exists over time. So if that pod happens to go away, bring it back, please. And then clean up. So if, if my custom resource is deleted, I want any of the resources that pod in this example to be deleted as well. And I'm going to use a couple of tools and I want to get into all the details you may have heard of some of these in other talks today, but quick uh, summary. Uh, operator SDK is a software development toolkit for building uh, Kubernetes applications. Uh, Podman is a, uh, a daemonless uh, container engine uh, management tool. We can basically I'll do a Podman push to, to get my uh, image uh, available to my cluster. And then kubectl uh, for uh, managing the Kubernetes cluster. And before we dive into a terminal, which I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to walk through what the steps that we're going to do, uh, give you some context without all the fluff of stuff actually happening. So we are going to use the SDK, operator SDK, to create a new operator. We're going to call it pod operator, as you can see on the right-hand side there. We'll use the SDK to add an API, which is our custom resource definition. Do you know? Uh, the specification, the spec, the, the, the details of the desired state are going to be empty initially. We're going to create a controller because the custom resource definition is not that useful unless we have some code that's uh, reacting to events around those resources. Uh, this controller gives us a lot out of the box. Like at this point, like I've not edited a line of code and it knows to watch my custom resource. Um, it's a contrived example, so it, it by default will watch also pods. Uh, it assigns ownership to uh, dependent resources that get created, which I'll go into a little more detail uh, later. And it has you know, basic frameworks for how to create a pod within your cluster. And then, while that's nice, it's not all that I want, uh, we're gonna go in and edit the code. We're gonna customize the custom resource definition to add three new fields, uh, the name, image, and command, so we can change what it is we deploy with our operator. And then we'll edit the controller to utilize those fields so that we actually do something with them. We will use SDK to build an image and then Podman to push that out to Quay.io. And then finally, kubectl to actually deploy this operator into a cluster.
We'll wrap up with actual testing. So great, it's deployed. Well, I'm going to show you it actually working. We're going to create the custom resource called pod request. We'll show that a pod gets created as a side effect of that because we're going to write that or have that controller code deployed in our cluster. We're going to show that when we delete this pod that was created by the controller, that it will come back. It's our second requirement. And our third requirement, when we delete that custom resource, we show that, yes, it actually does go and clean up our pod. All right, demo time. What could possibly go wrong? Finger for the demo dogs. <laughs> Okay, I'm in the wrong terminal. So real quick, the top portion of this is where I'm going to be showing running commands. Bottom left is the logs for our operator, which as you can see, it's waiting for the operator. We haven't deployed anything. The bottom right, we are watching for pods to show when the operator itself and um, the pod that we're creating as part of our controller are deployed and watching for our custom resource called pod request, or the plural in this case, pod requests. As you can see right now, it doesn't know about that. That resource doesn't exist in the cluster. So that's a good starting point. Got everything cleaned up from. So I'm creating the operator now. Um, it's pretty quick. Operator SDK, new name of operator. So now we have a new operator. It's called pod operator. It's that quick. Next, we're going to do probably the slowest step, other than pushing out to Quay, is creating a, a new custom resource definition. Um, so we're calling a pod request, and you add API. And what this is doing is, is creating the uh, JSON, uh, sorry, not JSON, the, um, the, the YAML definition on the file system, and then generating the Go code for this as well. Uh, next, create the controller. So we are watching pod requests with our controller. That one's super fast. I like that one. And now let's edit some code. Let's see which window it pops up in. It's not bad. All right. So I've got two files open right now. The first one here is the controller. And I'm not going to walk through all this. I'm just going to show a few relevant pieces. In this add function, uh, the first piece I want to show is the, the watching. So I, remember, I haven't changed anything. This is just what the SDK provides out of the box. Uh, I told it to create a controller for the pod request resource, and it did. And it's watching the pod request resource for me. So anytime there's an event, any event for pod request, it's going to hit what's called the reconcile loop, which is the, the next function I'll, I'll take a look at. Just keep that in your mind. We're watching for pod requests. Events cause the reconciliation to happen, mm -hmm. trying to move from desired state and reconcile to the running state. The next is the pod resource. So we're watching also for pods. But it doesn't enqueue a pod event. It looks for who owns this pod, who created this pod. If it is owned by this controller, we get an event enqueued for a reconcil reconciliation loop for the referenced pod request. So pod event causes reconciliation for the pod request. So we're always dealing with pod requests. We don't care about the pods as an event. We care about the pod requests, which is what we told our controller to, to handle. Now, scrolling down a bit. So our reconcile loop, this is the part. Um, in Lisa's diagrams, we had a controller block and loop. So it's just a, basically a hot loop that's waiting for events. Uh, it periodically wakes up as well. Like if there hasn't been an event, it'll be like, oh, should I have known about something? Did I miss <laughs> something? And then it'll run through this. It looks for uh, the pod request instance. If it doesn't exist, it bails. But assuming that we do have a pod request custom resource, in memory, we the controller creates the uh, pod, the dependent resource, and it's not, been, it's not been saved in the cluster yet, it's in memory. It sets a reference on that pod to the pod request, so this is how we get that relationship between the pod and our custom resource for enqueuing the uh, pod request events when pods change. And then we look for the pod. Should it, does it exist? 
If not, we go and create the pod. And then if it already existed, we just skip log that it, hey, you know, it already existed, nothing to do here, moving on. Oh, where'd my cursor go? There we go. The last bit is the creation of the pod. So we have a pod request and we simply define within Go the pod that we want to have in our cluster. Um, we have the metadata, so we have the, the name, we have the namespace, <coughs> set some labels by default, and then we have the specification for the pod. What container are we gonna run? This one's hard-coded. It's what came with the operator SDK out of the box. Um, gives us a name of BusyBox, an image of BusyBox, and the command is to sleep for 3,600 uh, seconds. We want to change that, but so we're going to go look at our custom resource definition. So this is the struct in Go. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about that. But there's a lot of good information online. There's a lot of good documentation links in the generated code to get you where you need to be to, to make modifications here. Just quickly high level, we've got three main chunks here that we talk about. The metadata, which is where you define the name of your resource, where you want to deploy it, and what namespace, labels, those kinds of standard things in Kubernetes resources. And then you have a spec and a status. Uh, we're going to change the spec because we want to change what our desired state is and define some additional fields. Status is really powerful when you're writing your own custom uh, resources and controllers because you can reflect state about the custom resource back to whatever might be interested in that through the status. You could say it's uh, provisioning something or it failed to um, you know, create a uh, PV or whatever. Like you can, you can capture information about what's going on about that resource in status. But we're gonna ignore it today. We're gonna go into the spec and you see they have lots of helpful uh, comments, edit this file, insert additional spec fields. So we're going to insert some additional spec fields here. And as I said earlier, we want three things. We want a name, which is a string. And I have to tell it in JSON, what do we want to call that? Oh, not my name. That's muscle memory. <laughs> don't Never done that don't running through this. Uh, <laughs> we wanted an image, which is also a string. Call that image in the JSON or YAML command, which is an array, missed it, of string. Arr. And save that, and we have now customized our custom resource definition. It's that easy, you're, you're, you're done. Almost, well, yes, good point. Almost done, we're not using it yet, so it's not actually useful. So we're gonna come back to our controller and tell the controller to do something with that data. And in here, we want to use the name, image, and command that comes in on our custom resource pod request, comes in the spec. We're gonna use the name field, spec, image, CR spec, command. And then I'm gonna make a change here because this annoys me to no end. Um, we know this is a pod. I don't need the name to say that it is a pod. I'm going to take it out. It's redundant. Save that, and I didn't flub anything, so it's good. And we're going to go build it. So we're done. We've, ne we've now customized our CRD, our custom resource definition. We've customized our controller to use it. And we're ready to go build it and deploy it. So next step, SDK build. Ready, set, go. So this is taking the Go that we have modified. It is uh, generating an image for us locally, and it's ready. And I'm now going to push this out to Quay, sort of. Um, I don't trust Wi-Fi here, so I'm actually going to force it. Go? Wow, it actually finished? Hardware. Oh, uh, yeah. Hardware. Um, I have a timeout after 15 seconds, so. Um, yep, and I actually, <laughs> assuming things wouldn't work so well, uh, I'm going to use a tag called demo. It's exactly <laughs> the same code that I've just presented. 
It is just kind of a you know, fail safe. Um, we're going to now deploy this into a running cluster. So I'm actually using an OpenShift dedicated uh, cluster. It's running uh, OpenShift version 4.2. 13, I think we're on now. Maybe 14 by now. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the latest and greatest. And we're going to <coughs> apply our operator and the custom resource. So what we should see is in the bottom right, we're going to see the pod for our operator come online, as well as see that it'll actually <coughs> recognize the, the pod request resource. And then once the pod is online, we'll see some logs for the, that operator spinning up. And should be fairly fast. I think time is like 12 seconds. Uh, see if I'm right. Is the operator? Um, we've got the pod, yep. Container creating. And we've got some logs. It's running. We're ready to go. We see no resources found, meaning that our custom resource has been defined. Uh, as you can see in the top now, we've got a, the YAML for one of our custom resources that we want to deploy. It's a pod request. We're going to, uh, we're keeping the, the same as the defaults. We're naming the pod. We're going to create BusyBox using the BusyBox image. But we're going to do something different instead of sleeping. I'm just going to have it loop indefinitely. And it's going to echo, hello, devcomp cz 2020, every five seconds. So most of the defaults were pretty good. Well, yeah. We could have changed it. Could have used like the hello we, world, we maybe. We choose, I, we choose not uh, to. We could have a, yep. we choose not to. And so creating the pod request, we can see it's been created. One second. Container is created. So we've got our pod called BusyBox already spinning up because it's not, a, it's not a loop that this controller is actually doing. It's waiting for events to be generated and being sent to the controller. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And the custom and now, resource is up there, too. Yep, got our custom resource. We can see in the logs. Um, got a request for, to reconcile that pod request. It realized, hey, I don't have this pod called BusyBox that I care about. I'm going to create it. And then we got a couple other events happening as state changes within the resources in the cluster as, as the pod moved from container cre knit to container creating to running. All of those are events that bubble up into our controller as pod request events. So is the pod doing what we want it to do? Yes. A lot of, uh, so the logs are showing a lot of uh, hello, uh, devcomp cc 2020. So it's working. And now you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill the pod. I'm killing BusyBox. And it's terminating. We saw an event in the bottom. Right, I'm gonna give us a little white space so we can check it out. So we got an event for the pod entering a terminating state. Um, it's just a coincidence. Yeah, one of the really cool things about this, the only code that we wrote around uh, the functionality that we're gonna show right here is the reference from the pod to the owning pod request. That is the only thing that we have to set. And because of that relationship, when we get the event for the- creating a new pod? Oh, you just got lucky. I don't know. It says terminating still. That is weird. Is it updating? OK, creating new pod. OK, good. Uh, because of the relationship, we got an event for the pod request. The pod request went and to find the pod in memory and then searched for it and found, hey, my pod isn't there. I expect this to be here. My desired state is not my running state. I'm going to change that. And it created the, the pod busy box with one line of code by just creating that relationship. Another benefit is we are going to delete our custom resource that we created. And because of that relationship, it's going to also delete the related pod. So it works both ways. So our custom resource is gone. We've got some events for the pod request. And we can see our pod is already terminating in the bottom right. It is gone. And we are done with the demo portion. It actually worked. Not bad. Uh, make sure I clicked on the right Excuse thing me. here so the clicker thinger works. So I can find how to move back over. All yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so that's great. We have an operator. One other thing I want to just call out is how you can distribute these operators. Um, what we did is the first thing you see on the side here is just the raw manifest. You know, cube cuddle, create, apply, replace, whatever state you are in the life cycle of your resource. Um, you can deploy them straight from GitHub. 
You can also use Operator Lifecycle Manager, OLM, which is what we use within our team for deploying our operators. It's a very powerful operator itself for managing the life cycle of operators. So the deployment, upgrades, and deletion, uh, it's, it's, it's really great. OperatorHub.io, great resource for deploying or making your Kubernetes operators available. Uh, generally, it's, it's part of the OpenShift platform as well. It's also, we, good, we, it's also good for discovering operators. To yeah, go out there, to see what are out there, see what you might want to, to, to pick up for your own use cases. Why, why write it when it already exists for you? And then a plethora of other things that I'm not going to try to enumerate here, but there's a lot of other things here. And I think at that point, all right. Back let's, to Lisa, thank you. All right, let's, let's bring it on home, because um, it's almost time for work from. So like the human counterparts, operators are here to do work. Uh, we think that the operator pattern is a really good way to abstract all the work that we do a lot and let the API help us do with computers to let humans do creative problems. We model, well, we try to model all of our work into custom resources and then write controllers to handle changes in events with them. And because we're able to do that effectively, a lot of our work is now automated in a way that scales, it's redundant, and it's available. Now, when you all go ahead and start writing your own operators. You don't need to be limited to the operations types of things that we showed. You can do whatever you want. The sky is the limit. It is really impossible to enumerate all of them because everyone's use case is different and that's the beauty of operators is that you can tailor it to your specific needs. And with that, uh, 10 points if you can scan a QR code from in the back row. And <laughs> um, if there's any questions, we have time. Yes? These uh, operators look really cool. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, Kubernetes newbie, but it looks like it saves so much work. Um, I would like to ask how do operators work with GitOps? I really, really like the appeal of GitOps that uh, Git is the single source of proof and all the state of my cluster or cl maybe even clusters is described in a single repository. Mm -hmm. But it seems like this is in conflict with operators that mm -hmm. automatically do the st stuff in the background and change things how they see. So is it a conflict? How does this nope. play together? Nope. We, we use the GitOps model in our team. Um, everything we do is in Git, not necessarily public Git repositories, but there are, we drive all of our work through Git. Yep. So I think they can work in concert. I mean, one of the things to remember is these operators are deployed as resources in the cluster themselves using the standard resources that the platform provides. And uh, once you've deployed them, once you've also deployed your custom resource definitions, again, you're back to just resources in the cluster. So the, the processes, the Git, GitOps flows for how you manage things are a perfect fit for both the deployment of mm -hmm. and the utilization of your operators. Yeah, it's a good complement. And if I may, what is the tool you use for GitOps? Is it Argo CD or Flux or something different? We use something, well, did you sit on the keynote on Friday? No, Friday morning? Unfortunately not. Okay, that is, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and part of the keynote was, uh, was it a, a, a day in the life or? Day in the life of SRE. Yeah, day in the life of SRE. As I mentioned, I got paged in the middle yeah, of that. So I know, I yeah, <laughs> we're, we're kind of distracted, that's fine. Um, so we manage the platform. And on top of us is another layer called um, App SRE, the application SREs that are deployed on top of it. The App SRE team for us manages the, the workflow to get from Git into the uh, production clusters into staging. Um, so they have, I think it's based on Jenkins? Yes. Yeah, I it think it's right ultimately now. Jenkins under the hood. Um, that may be changing. Um, I don't know. Uh, could be changing, but it's mostly Jenkins. But I think I, I, mean, I think do. shell scripts would work. Yeah, there's all sorts of options. I don't think there's any one tool that would be best. It's what is going to be a good fit for your organization. What do you know, or others in your team know, and mm -hmm. what are you willing to adopt broadly? Yeah, um, we use a combination of OLM, which we mentioned, and <coughs> Jenkins and some homemade stuff, like make files and like that. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? So did the QR code scan in the back? Oh, you pretty sweet. It did? 
Woo! High five. <laughs> All right. Nice. Yes? Do you have any good examples for operators that work outside of the cluster? Outside so of the cluster. So operator. The operator runs in the cluster, but whatever it measures is completely outside of yes. the cluster. Mm -hmm. Yes. Has nothing to do with Kubernetes. S so we have user duty. We have yeah several operators that we run in a like a management cluster to administer external services like PagerDuty, uh, Deadman Snitch, um, interacting with Let's Encrypt for generation of certificates. Well, that interacts kind of with the with the cluster because of the secrets and stuff. Yeah, and those ultimately we we we've segmented those out from our OpenShift dedicated clusters because um, we don't want that management credentials in a cluster that are customers can access and then they get pushed in using a tool uh, called Hive. Uh, that is, I don't know where that is from a product point of view, but it's OpenShift at Oregon GitHub yeah. uh, okay. Hive project. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding the microservices. Yes. Uh, so I don't know much about it. So, uh, well, uh, I was in uh, a talk uh, related to Cogito which helps you to define your business process uh, for your Java applications, and then convert it into microservices. Um, so since we are talking about operators are microservices, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious to see if here's something that can help you to, to design the business process, of, I don't know, the whole architecture yeah, of the business, microservices. Yeah, um, business process definitions definitely um, a whole different domain of a problem set. I, I, one thing I, I, I didn't mention, like I, operators are, are, are hypothesis theory, assertion, whatever. Operators are microservices, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that microservices are operators. I don't think I that think you know everything could be defined as an operator. But yeah. um, so that's probably a domain in which it's um, much more uh, difficult to fit an operator into the, the model for yeah, business. Got it. Then I would and oh. we, are we are out of time. Out of time. All right. Thanks Thank you, everybody. everybody.